believe while you're talking, it's not because I don't like what you say. <laughs> Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, see we got a lot of visitors here. That's great. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and call the um, Small Business Development Committee to order. Uh, and the first order of business is to make sure we have uh, a quorum, and we do. And we have a lot of wonderful guests here to, to, to on the agenda. But first, I would like to open our meeting with prayer. Is Representative Schofield. Thank you. The mic is yours. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom, knowledge, understanding, grace that you've given to each of us. I pray for each committee member. We stand together praying for all small businesses across Georgia. We ask that the Spirit lead, direct, and order this meeting. Let our words and works glorify you, Lord, and let this committee be a beacon of hope and light across Georgia. We ask, pray, and believe all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Representative Schofield. That was quite good. Um, well, let me just lay out uh, what we're going to do first, if that's okay. Uh, we have representatives from, from the um, Automobile Dealership Association and from the Convenience Store Association. And what I'd like to do is get the automobile dealers to go first. And um, Ben, if you and Bill could start things off and then introduce your members and introduce them as they speak and bring a, a bring their perspective on business in our in in the state of Georgia. So, Ben Jordan, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to everyone, and happy day 29, crossover day plus one. I'm uh, Ben Jordan from the Georgia Automobile Dealers Association. If it's okay, I'll introduce you to the rest of the GADA team. Um, our family, as we like to call it, and as well as the two franchise dealers that we have here today. Um, I'm here with our president and CEO, Leah Kirshner, um, our uh, director of government relations, Taylor Hartshorn, and our president emeritus, Bill Morey, who has celebrated his 50th year with GADA just wow. this year. So. Ben, speak a little bit more in the microphone. Yeah, absolutely. Bring it up. We are hopeful that Bill Morey spends another 50 years with GADA. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm hopeful for that. <laughs> At uh, GADA, we represent the state's franchise new car and truck dealers. Um, we represent approximately 500 dealerships in Georgia, and our members do business in every part of the state. So in metro Atlanta, in the rural parts of the state, uh, by the coast, and up in the mountains. Our members employ over 30,000 Georgians. Uh, and the average salary for an employee at a franchise dealership in Georgia is over $61,000. We like to say those are strong middle-class jobs um, in probably every one of your communities. And when you consider the jobs that are dependent on franchise new car dealerships, um, we believe that our members alone and the business they generate account for over 70,000 jobs in the state. Um, the average new car dealership in Georgia employs 68 people. So most of our members, our franchise new car and truck dealerships are considered small businesses. Now I know everyone in here probably has driven a vehicle at some point in their lives. So we all have some familiarity with uh, how that process works. But I wanted to give you a little idea about where we, the new car dealers fit in the overall automobile industry. Um, first and foremost, as franchise new car dealers, our members sell both new and used vehicles. Uh, there are some other car dealers who just sell used vehicles, and they're all part of the big automotive family too. Uh, but what distinguishes our members is, they, is that they sell both new and used vehicles. In addition to selling those vehicles, our dealers also perform uh, safety critical repair and maintenance on vehicles. Uh, they're certified by their manufacturers to make repairs covered under a factory warranty and to fix vehicles subject to recalls. Um, as a result, our dealers employ a lot of highly trained technicians who perform uh, those tasks throughout Georgia every day. Our dealers also, some of our dealers also um, operate body shops that repair vehicles after a collision. Uh, our dealers also help 
customers arrange financing when they want to buy a vehicle. So if you have a pre-existing relationship with your bank, you can certainly bring that to the automobile transaction. But if you don't, our dealers are capable um, of helping arrange for financing for you and getting um, finance entities to compete against each other to get you the best price and the best terms on your loan. Our dealers also help value your trade-in and they'll handle all title and registration for customers when buying a new vehicle. Uh, because our dealers perform all these services, franchise dealerships are considered essential businesses. We've heard a lot about that term over the last year, uh, but we're proud to say that both the federal government and the state of Georgia has deemed franchise new car dealerships part and their employees part of the nation's critical infrastructure. Um, another feature of our businesses is our, our dealers relationship with their manufacturers. We're called franchise dealers because our dealers are franchisees of the big automobile factories. For instance, we have a Mercedes-Benz dealer here. He's a, they are a franchisee of uh, Mercedes-Benz. Same with the Nissan dealer you'll hear from later today. Their operation is a franchisee of Nissan. Um, and because of the unique nature of them being franchisees and because of the critical role they play um, in Georgia's economy and its uh, infrastructure. There are a set of laws that the General Assembly has passed that regulates the relationship between automobile manufacturer and new car dealer. We refer to those laws as uh, our franchise law. Uh, in fact, in addition to having a set of laws in Georgia code, the state constitution empowers you, the General Assembly, to ensure that that relationship between automobile manufacturer and new car dealer uh, is beneficial, that the, that the dealerships are allowed to continue performing their essential functions uh, to the Georgia citizens, and that most importantly, the consuming public um, benefits from that relationship, that they have easy access to vehicles when they need it, and they have easy and convenient access to uh, warranty repairs and um, recall repairs when needed. So that's a little quick background of GADA and hopefully um, it gives you a little context of where we fit in the overall system. And if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I'll introduce our first franchise dealer. Uh, members of the committee, um, I'm proud to introduce you to Mr. Bo Scott from Regal Nissan. Good morning, Chairman Chiokas and members of the committee. My name is Bo Scott, and I am the president and dealer principal of Regal Nissan in beautiful Roswell, Georgia. I currently serve on the board of directors for the Georgia Automobile Dealers Association and the Metro Atlanta Automobile Dealers Association, as well as the Nissan Regional Dealer Advisory Board, and I've recently served on the Nissan EV Committee. I wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity today to talk about running a small business in Georgia. To give you a little background about myself and Regal Nissan, I'm a second generation dealer. My dad founded Regal Nissan in 1980. When I returned home from serving in the Marine Corps in 1990, I joined the family business as a salesperson. After that, I worked in a number of different roles at the dealership and became a dealer principal in 2014 after my dad lost his battle with cancer. Working in many roles at the dealership taught me how important a quality family of employees is to create, a, create strong ties between our dealership and the customers and the community, community where we serve. Let me tell you a little bit about Regal Nissan in Roswell. We have 106 employees the average salary for a Regal employee is $74,519, good paying jobs. We support many charities, many faith-based charities, Toys for Tots every year for many years, veterans charities. We partnered with Hunger Has No Religion, which focuses on the homeless community in Atlanta. We've, uh, during the pandemic, we, uh, worked especially hard to focus our ordering on uh, locally owned and operated businesses in our community, as opposed to ordering maybe a lunch from a bigger chain. We, we went to the mom and pop type restaurants in, in Roswell, knew they were struggling and how could we help? We also 
purchased some meals for uh, our first responders and fire department in both Roswell and Alpharetta. And uh, that kind of spread and people were like, hey, where's our lunch? So we, we ended up we're doing some of that. Uh, I've, I've watched the industry change in the last 41 years. Regal Nissan has embraced those changes every step of the way. Our dealership has not only embraced the transition to electric vehicles, but we have been a leader in that space for the last 10 years. Certainly the past year has been a challenging one. The pandemic certainly has a big impact on our business as we have seen about a 15% uh, drop in service and parts business. <clears throat> We've had to implement cleaning schedules and new hours to adapt. We had developed a line, uh, online transactions. So our sales staff is constantly recording demo videos to share with customers, as opposed to having the customers come in, we, we record those, those feature presentations and share them with our customers. We've had to make at-home deliveries available. Not that we didn't have a problem with that before, but now it's become part of our standard operating procedure. But not only in sales, we also do that in service. We offer to come pick up vehicles at people's homes or their businesses and bring them in and get them serviced and then bring them back. Uh, while I say that we are better than we were initially, demand is still not what we had seen in the past. There has been some disruption and can you, continues to be in the supply of cars and parts um, disruptions due to contributing uh, suppliers. As I said earlier, we made dramatic cuts to operating hours for our employees and customer safety, and we are slowly beginning to return to normal. We determined early on not to lay off any of our people and to try our best to keep their wages commiserate to before the pandemic, especially in the early months. We see the automobile business as being a very positive impact. While we were deemed an essential business, many of our customers' work and driving habits have changed. Uh, pent up demand for sales of new and pre-owned um, cars and service, I think are gonna soon be respond, responding uh, as we see more and more people returning back to nor more normal driving habits, taking kids to school, um, going on vacations, going on trips, visiting family, and certainly commuting back and forth to work. So we are about to invest many thousands of dollars in another DC fast charger to charge up electric vehicles. This will be our third generation of DC fast charger that we've installed. Uh, we are in the process of ordering new tools and equipment for our service department. As we anticipate service demand will be going up as the vaccine mitigates and the workforce returns to more normal and driving habits return, resume. I would like the committee to know that the dealership, a dealership like mine provide a wide variety of job opportunities for folks in this state. They include sales and service and finance. We are an indirect lender. So we offer financing and different products of that nature. Management, titling, accounting, business development people, which, which uh, work on answering leads and reaching out to customers online. Also social media people. So if there are members of your community looking for work, I'd encourage them to consider reaching out to their local franchise dealer. That can be a great place to begin a career or start a new career path. <clears throat> if I was asked what the state could do to help small businesses like mine, what would my answer be? I would say, first of all, a, a tax structure that is simple, fair, and easy to comply with a regulatory system that is not overly burdensome and that allows small businesses like mine the opportunity to succeed. To keep in mind that there are already many regulations that businesses must comply with, OSHA, EPA, titling, TAVT, sales, taxes, uh, tons of paperwork, uh, and anything else is just another layer of regulatory paperwork. So when we, we think about those things, just consider that, that somebody has to implement some of the things that we pass. 
But uh, most of all, I would say an emphasis, and I've already had the opportunity to speak about this today, an emphasis on workforce development. We have that particular need for service technicians. And every time I speak to one of my peers at, at a GADA function, at a Nissan function, that is always there, even a phone call, almost always comes up that where are you finding technicians? Where are you getting technicians? We can't find technicians. We can't find technicians. We're doing this. And we try to share ideas of how we are developing technicians. I would say that that's one area that the state of Georgia could help is in developing technicians. As I said before, some of those are some good paying jobs. We've got technicians make over $100,000 a year. People don't realize that, but technicians are very proficient. Um, they have to work with electronics and computers and, but you know, they still have to, like the old days, they still have to put belts on cars and work on transmissions and, and they, they're, they are truly technicians. They are craftsmen and they are well compensated. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about a lot of things about trying to encourage people to go to college. I think we need to encourage more people into technical fields. Um, I know I wasn't really cut out for college. I wasn't a great student, but, uh, but I, I love the automobile business and, and I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak, to speak to you today. Uh, and I would like to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Bo, that was a great presentation. We've got one question, well, we've got two questions and any online and I wanna limit the questions to these two because we have more to follow. And then uh, after you answer these questions, uh, uh, Senator Butch Miller, if you're still here, we're going to slide you in. All right, number, number six. Who's number six? Me. Good. <laughs> Not so much a question, Bo, but as just for the committee members that Regal Nissan and Roswell is a valuable partner in our community. And also my family, my family has had multiple cars and purchases that we purchased from your dealership. So they are quality operation, have always been very supportive, uh, work with numerous, not just nonprofits, but it's kind of what ha have held the community of Roswell together so well. So I just wanted to personally thank you also. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I'll ask the question that you and your colleagues ask each other. Where do you find your technicians? Um, well, you know, I'm not going to give away any trade secrets, but uh, sure. I, we've always been believe, a believer. I, I think uh, I was speaking to somebody today and they were talking about from promoting from within. What we do is we developed a program where we take young students, uh, young people, maybe an entry level person. Maybe he's done a pretty good job as a valet he's got a good attitude, he's got a good aptitude, and we will team them up with a master technician. It's an apprenticeship program. And the master technician is working alongside of this, of this younger technician. And, and we work out an arrangement so that uh, their pay is, they're paid on an hourly basis and they are learning from a master technician. And he is instructing them how to do a brake job, how to look this, how to train, you know, and then we start sending them to Nissan training. So we develop them along the way. We have eight master technicians and, and I think all of them were started that way and uh, we train them ourselves. So um, that's how we, we try to do that. But I've, I've seen a lot of industry uh, people and I, I've read an interesting article where they've even started their own technical school and they will reach out to the local high schools. And that's something we're considering doing and maybe hiring at our own technical trainer to come in and start start classes because I think that's just an outstanding. It, it's it's got to be done. If I may, one follow up quick question, Mr. Chairman: Are you are you able to hire any that are graduating or attending tech schools? Yes, we are. We uh, we work a uh, uh, a program where they'll they'll work a quarter and then they'll go to the tech school a quarter. Uh, and they'll work at the same time they're going to technical school. So we do, we do hire those people. We, have, we try to get them while they're in technical school already. Thank you. Great, Both. thank you very much for your presentation. Senator Miller, 
I, we're going to let you have the floor because I know you have a busy schedule today to look at all those house bills that are coming your way. We're, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members. And we are looking at a lot of house bills. We had all house bills in our rules uh, calendar today and moved a lot of them. We're gonna have another rules uh, committee meeting this afternoon. So we're gonna be looking at those again. And it's a great place to perfect house bills and sending them over to the Senate. <laughs> So, so, so uh, I, I will be brief, but I want to tell you thank you for letting me uh, join you for a moment or two. When we talk about uh, uh, re small retailers, we talk about automobile dealers, when we talk about um, small business, we talk about the fabric of America. We talk about where young people get their first job, where they learn not only a work ethic, but they learn soft skills where they learn uh, how, to, how to deal with confrontation, how, the, how to get along in the world. And I think it's very, very important that small business uh, flourish. And uh, no matter what that business is, whether it, you're, you're hiring that temporary or that seasonal worker in, a, uh, in an automobile dealership, a convenience store, a, a, a medical office, a dental office, a funeral home, a real estate, wherever, you know, you, you have those young people that have the opportunity to learn those soft skills and learn a work ethic. And um, there were two, two iconic guys in my life that were in the automobile business. And, and I'll, I'll speak to that, but that I haven't just been in the automobile business. I've been a retailer all my life. When my grandparent, when I was growing up, my grandparents had shoe stores in South Carolina. And my grandfather, he owned a shoe store named Coleman store, the Coleman shoes and across the street, he had one named Phillips shoes but he didn't tell anybody in town he owned both stores. <laughs> so if somebody came in wanting something in Coleman's shoes, a size seven and a half narrow, my grandfather would send me scooting out the back door. I'd run around the block, run around, come in the back door of Phillips and give me a, give me a seven and a half narrow. I'd run around back, take it back to the customer. <laughs> but you know, and, and small businesses adapt. And as we have seen in the uh, COVID-19 protocols, whether it's uh, heightened awareness, whether it's social distancing where, where possible and when possible, whether it's uh, uh, increasing our, our sanitation and our uh, hygiene around the dealership and in the dealership and, uh, and adjusting to, as Bo mentioned, adjusting to different ways of retailing, uh, small business is uh, where the rubber meets the road. And I don't know what the exact percentages are, but overwhelming percentages of American, Americans employed are employed in small businesses. And, uh, and that's what, uh, what's really important. Those two iconic guys were uh, in my life in the car business were uh, Jerry Brown, Jerry Brown Chevrolet in Buford, Georgia. And of course, Milton Martin. And I remember going to Jerry Brown Chevrolet when I was a kid and Mr. Brown, whatever, the, whatever was going on in our community in Buford, he was a part, whatever was good, he was a part of. And Milton Martin was the same way. And he said, a car dealer is supposed to be involved in his community. And I think that's uh, what, what I want to share with this today. And, and as I look, I see my, my constituents here, uh, the Bowers and uh, just, and, and their involvement in their community has changed the trajectory, particularly of one of my children's life. Um, one of our sons uh, had a great exposure uh, and great opportunities as a result of the Bowers efforts and the Bowers involvement in our community. So thank you very much for letting me say hello this morning. I appreciate it very much, Mr. Chairman, and just send those house bills over there to us. We'll get them all fixed up and <laughs> <laughs> get them back to you. Thank you very, thank you again. And I presume there'll be no questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have enough time for questions today, but we'll be happy to send you some. I've got about three or four myself well, on, the, I, I, on the status of a couple of bills. So that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just, you just give me the list and we'll get them in there. Yes, Thanks sir. so much. Y'all have a great day. Thank, Thank you. Me. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. And uh, now for our next presenter, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Barranco. Did I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> okay. Please step up to the podium. Well, first of all, let me just say um, one great big ditto to what Butch and Bo, Bo said. Uh, we'll try not to 
duplicate everything, but uh, pretty much that's what we were gonna say too, everything they said. But first of all, Mr. Chairman and committee members, we are just absolutely delighted to be here this, this um, morning um, to talk about a subject that means the world to us, frankly. And um, so I wanna start out by saying that, uh, give a shout out, if you will, to GADA. Uh, we've been in the, uh, we started, we opened our first dealership on April 4th, 1978. And um, one of the first things we did uh, after we got settled and started making a little bit of money was to join GADA. So it's been a wonderful organization for the state, for the automobile dealers. Um, and in the 43 years that we've been in business, um, most of those years we've been with GADA, which basically means that I have a lot of stories to tell about Bill Morey. <laughs> but we're not going to bore you with those. And you probably have some of your own if you know Bill at all. But it's been a, a wonderful um, um, career and business that we've had here in Georgia for these 43 years. Uh, we've done a lot of nonprofit work, just as Bo mentioned. We've been on the, we did the uh, Grady Gala. We've done work with the homeless. That's a, a really hot topic right now. But I want to start with where Bo left off uh, with the technicians, because we have a real life story that Gregory and I are going to share together um, about uh, uh, what happened several years ago. First of all, I was on the Board of Education and I was appointed to that board by Governor Joe Frank Harris. I then went on to the Board of Regents and I was appointed to that board by Governor Zell Miller. So, but when I was on the State Board of Education and we were both at, uh, involved with GADA, we had the age old problem of trying to find technicians. And so together, Gregory was a director on the board of GADA and I was on the State Board of Education. And at that time, most of you are too young to remember, but the um, vocational technical school was a part of the Board of Education back in those days. And so we came up with the idea that what we wanted to do, we needed the technicians. So we said that what is the biggest challenge, and this is real life stuff here, what is the biggest challenge for a new technician? And the biggest challenge they have is that getting that first set of tools. In those days, that first set of tools was roughly $1,000. Now I think it's roughly about $4,000 for that first set of tools. So we went to all the vocational technical schools and established a relationship with them. And through GADA, we were able to pull this off. And we said, let us know, let the dealers know who your best students are essentially. And we will uh, pay their tuition as well as by their first set of tools. And we did that and that is what supplied our technicians. So that is a cooperation that we had with a state school system, that is the vocational technical schools and the Georgia automobile dealers. That was a relationship that we started. So that's a real life story of how this thing can work. Um, let's see, they, um, we've, you, one of the things we didn't work out is how we're going to tag team this thing. You know, <laughs> I have my notes here, as him, but we forgot to work that out. <laughs> uh, Chairman Jokers and members of the committee, I, a, a, little, a little bit of um, improvement on that. We, um, I was on the board for GADA. I was president of the Metro Atlanta Automobile Dealers Association when we set that up. So the Metro Atlanta Automobile Dealers Association was who supported it financially, GADA, many members, because we're you know the same people except one state where I didn't know it was the Metro. But that program uh, in the Metro Atlanta Automobile Dealers Association still has a training program for technicians. At, we're, um, our dealership is Mercedes-Benz of Buckhead. So it's, um, and we've been at it, as Juanita said, 43 years. So we uh, have grown, we've represented uh, several, seven franchises, starting with uh, Pontiac and ending with Mercedes. We have Mercedes-Benz in Buckhead and Mercedes-Benz of Covington, Louisiana. We're from South Louisiana originally. So we do uh, our training in Buckhead. We have 201 employees 
Average income is about $84,000 per employee, 200 million in sales. Um, so it's a big dealership, 52 technicians. So we train our technicians in-house primarily working with uh, MAADA. And we, so we have a training team and we develop those em employees up and they go all the way. So just the kind of thing that Bo was talking about, somebody walking in the door, we put our arms around them, to make sure that we can help them grow and become uh, real community members. Uh, Juanita's a uh, little modest. She, uh, she chaired the Board of Regents uh, and served on the Board of Regents 20 years. No, just 10. 10. <laughs> well, 10, 10 on the... Um, I was 10, I, I, no, well, seven on the State Board of Education and 10 on the Board of Regents. Um, close to 20 to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when I, um, I started out my first job, when we opened this dealership in 1978, uh, we were very young um, and very broke. So somebody needed a job. So I went to work for the attorney general's office and uh, Arthur Bolton, Mike Bowers was a colleague of mine at the time and Arthur Bolton was my first boss. And so I know this area quite well. So it feels good to be back in here, back here. Um, but having that experience as with the attorney general's office um, was very valuable to me in business. In fact, the first thing he said was, don't sell any cars to the state. <laughs> so, and we did not, could have used the business though. But my background is this, and I'll tell this quick story as well. Um, I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is North Louisiana. My husband always says I'm from Texas. Um, but um, my father was a lawyer, but he also owned an Esso station, now Exxon. And uh, so I became a lawyer and a car dealer. So he was a lawyer and owned an Exxon section. But when the manufacturers first came out with the distribution channels for retail automobile sales, the, they came to the service station owners and asked them would they become automobile dealers. And my father really wanted one of those dealerships, um, but was not offered one. And the reason is pretty obvious was the color of his skin. And so I sort of grew up we both did. We grew up in the um, love affair with the automobile. So when Gregory did an internship at Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan, we decided that we really wanted to ultimately become automobile dealers. This was our dream. For me, it was sort of a mission almost um, to get into this business because of what had happened to my father. But, you know, we don't have any hard feelings, but it made me more determined than ever to want to be successful. And we've done that. As Gregory mentioned, we've had a number of franchises and we are always members of the community. Bo talked about it. We really do serve the community. Um, you know, we've done so much with uh, um, uh, Choa, with uh, Grady. We provided meals during the pandemic. The pandemic was a challenge, but as, as Bo mentioned, we are considered an essential business, but our people came through. Our people came through. My daughter, uh, who's not with me today, because uh, she's at work, <laughs> but she had started a digital marketing program a year, a couple of years before COVID hit. And so we were ready. We were absolutely ready to get into digital marketing. Um, one of the things we're trying to figure out now is what is life going to be like after uh, COVID? We know things have, some things have forever changed and that's a good thing. That is not a bad thing. We are happy that things have changed and we're happy to be a part of it. Um, one of the issues right now is um, security. And people don't like to talk about that much, but we're, we're getting a lot of cash into the dealerships. That's something that's new. A lot of businesses, not just dealerships, have a lot of cash out there. Well, that has caused us to increase our security. In fact, I just got a note from our receptionist thanking me for the additional security that we have put uh, at the dealership, because the one thing you want is for your employees and your customers to feel very comfortable. And so that gives them a sense of, of comfort we are um, um, continuing to expand. 
One of the things and one of the questions we've been asked to comment on is what can the state do? Well, we just finished a sales tax audit. Now we did that sales tax audit because of COVID took more than a year to get through. Um, and that's primarily because of COVID. But I wanna mention something to this committee and it is no one's fault, but there are within that tax code, within the revenue code, a lot of conflicts. And I would guarantee you that if you put Bo, Juanita, Gregory and four or five other dealers and ask a particular tax question on um, um, sales tax or um, what is the other one, TVA uh, tax, TVAT tax, is that right? Okay. <laughs> you would get five different answers. And not only from us as dealers, but you would also get different answers within the revenue department, not calling any names. But I do wanna make it clear, it's not anyone's fault because apparently, and Mr. Chairman or somebody, please correct me, but from my understanding is that many of these bills come from different committees. That's correct, right? And so, there's not a lot of opportunity for conversation, both from the people at the revenue department, and you don't have a lot of input from the dealers as well, or other small businesses. So that would be something I would personally ask, is that you find some sort of communication mechanism so that the bills are not conflicting. And, uh, but this does happen, it happened with us. Um, we spent a ton of money with our accounting firm, and believe me, we had a lot of brain cells on this and people kept coming up with different answers. And uh, it turned out with a pretty good result at the end of the day, but um, there, so that's one area I know, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to address in particular. No, I just want to say that, you know, what we do, we, we are in the community and we answer to the customer. Ultimately, you know, we, we can keep up with the laws, we'll figure it out. We can keep up with the, the manufacturer we figured out, but the customers, and Juanita uses the term fluid, we answer to the customer day in and day out, and we create jobs, we're economic generators for our community. That's what an automobile dealer is. The franchise, I can tell you for Juanita and I, uh, we've overcome a lot, but we've had great support, GADA, MADA, the legislature. You know, George is a great place to do business. Are there hurdles? Absolutely. But if you're willing to get up, you can find the support to make it happen. And so we're, we're here to serve our community. That's what we do. And if you, you know, if any questions, I, you know, I'd be happy to entertain them. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. In the sure interest of time, we're going yes. to hold the questions because we still have a, Ms. Angela Holland to come speak to us from the Convenience Store Association. So Ms. Angela, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much. Right, you're awesome. So I know we're pushed on time and I did, I felt like a great job writing all this down so that I could make sure I said it all, but I'm going to have to skim through it. So y'all just bear with me, but Chairman Chokas, thank you so much. Members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Angela Holland. I serve as the president of the Georgia Association of Convenience Stores. We represent roughly a third of the stores in the market. With me today are Ms. Haley Bauer, Clipper Petroleum of Flowery Branch, Georgia, and Mr. Matt Jones with Friendly Gus Food Stores in Dublin, Georgia. And I think they're gonna provide specifics on their companies um, very soon. So uh, real quickly, convenience stores are a new industry in the marketplace because in 1950, we were um, gas stations or service stations with auto mechanic bays. And so that has evolved in today's convenience store. And the evolution, there's more evolution on the horizon with electric vehicles um, and even a greater need for convenience in with delivery services. So um, I had a few other really cool facts there, but I will say convenience store customers appreciate our locations, our extended hours of service, 
the grab and go food service opportunity, the variety of, of products that we have and the fast transaction, it takes on average three minutes and 33 seconds to get out of your car, make your purchase and to be back in your vehicle. There are more than 150,000 convenience stores in the United States and 90,000 of those, over 90,000 of those are single store operators. In Georgia, we have 6,667 stores and 77% 70, of those are single store operators. Georgia is the fifth most saturated state in the country with stores located approximately every one, one in every nine square miles. And this statistic alone puts us closer to our customers than any other retail channel. We serve millions of Georgians daily, processing over seven and a half million transactions every day. And in much of rural Georgia, we fill the food desert gap. While there's notable saturation, after the passage of House Bill 170 in 2015, which increased the gas tax, several of my members with border locations in LaGrange or Augusta sold those locations and purchased stores across the border. Specific to Georgia, we are 74% of the lottery sales force and we bring in 83% of the total lottery sales last calendar year. We're very proud to be a part of that uh, process and to help deserving students reach their goals. Several years ago, we created the GS, GACS GEMS program, members going the extra mile stories. Uh, my, my members give back to their communities. Some of them through the Muscular Dystrophy Association, United Way, local schools. Um, I have members that have donated funds to colleges, uh, some that have established foundations to support uh, charitable initiatives throughout the state, but many small businesses can't afford those types of donations. So they do what they can, whether it's fuel up Friday so that a percentage of their every gallon of gas sold goes to a local charity or hero parking for their veterans. They all give back in some fashion. In 2018, we partnered with In Our Backyard, a nonprofit organization that developed the Convenience Stores Against Trafficking program. And Haley's gonna do a little deeper dive into that. But I wanna to touch really quick on the Super Bowl stats. Working with In Our Backyard in 2019, we had over 400 volunteers gather the week of the Super Bowl or the week before the Super Bowl in Atlanta. And we distributed human trafficking flyers to more than 1200 convenience stores placed freedom stickers in restrooms and distributing missing children's booklets. Within the week, 13 of those 34 missing children were recovered. And as of May 24th, 2019, 29 of the 34 had been recovered. <laughs> Along with two adult victims and 169 sex buyers had been arrested by the GBI and FBI. It's a program we're very proud of. We continue to support it. We write articles in our magazine. We send out information constantly to our members. Um, we post stuff on social media and we continue to have educational programs at all of our functions. We also promote some other training programs but our members are not not members because of the, these services and programs, they're members because of the legisla legisla legislative and regulatory representation and the state of emergency coverage that we provide year round. We constantly monitor the weather and keep a close eye on events that impact fuel supply. Most of Georgia's fuel originates from refineries located along the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricanes in the Southern United States can temporarily interrupt fuel distribution. So it's part of our job to communicate state of emergencies to our members and to work with regulatory agencies to ensure members can quickly and safely provide food and fuel to customers during catastrophic events. 
During the first few months of COVID-19, uh, we communicated daily and sometimes hourly with our members on various issues. And it's extremely important to keep essential, essential businesses as functional as possible before and after any disaster. Our stores provide food and fuel to first responders and without it, their job would be impossible. When catastrophic weather events have been forecasted, our office begins immediately working with government agencies and regional coalitions of associations to secure waivers from federal and state agencies to help secure a seamless supply of necessities. 2016 was my first year in this position and I had no idea what the fall was gonna hold for me in my industry. September 1st, we started off with a tropical storm warning. I think it was tropical storm Hermione, followed by uh, September 13th, two weeks later, a pipeline rupture. Two weeks later, October 4th, we were bracing for a hurricane with mandatory coastal evacuations. Two weeks later, October 31st, Colonial Pipeline had an explosion in Shelby, Alabama. All four of those results, uh, all four of those catastrophes resulted in a state of emergency. And quite frankly, I was overwhelmed. My members were overwhelmed, um, but we worked tirelessly and made sure we kept fuel on the ground and food on the shelves and we're there for first responders. During those evacuations, our office was the link between first responders who needed fuel and finding locations that had it. We were also um, very active with nursing homes who had had to evacuate and they needed to make sure they had a fuel supply to return. So we hooked them up with retailers that could help with that supply. And our employees were the last evacuees. So convenience stores are critical to their communities, most especially during a disaster. Oh, I didn't flip that slide just right. Sorry about that. Um, Legislative and regulatory um, representation. I see most of you on the, the third floor, and so you know we work tirelessly to represent our, our industry, but what you may not know are some of our issues. So thank you again, Chairman Chokas, for the opportunity. <clears throat> some of the most stressful issues we have are border issues, meaning the impact is going to be felt most to the stores in Augusta, LaGrange, Columbus, Blakely, Bainbridge, Thomasville, Valdosta, Savannah, and other smaller cities located along the border. Tax increases in the products that convenience stores sell will drive our customers to the surrounding states. Fuel is the only, the only staple product priced at the street. And as such, customers will unknowingly drive out a dollar's worth of gas to save 50 cents at the pump. So it's important when contemplating a tax increase to consider the unintended consequences to small businesses along the border, especially those located in food deserts. We follow a wide range of issues, including lottery, gaming, labor relations, legal issues, tort reform, criminal justice, civil asset forfeiture, local government, transportation, public assistance, SNAP benefits, alcohol, tobacco, environmental taxation, food and food production, recycling, and a few others. But once you all have passed legislation, it's crucial that our association has a strong affiliation with governmental agencies who regulate our industry. Many of our members look to me when changes are made and sometimes just for answers. But as such, we work with the Department of Revenue, Labor, Agriculture, Natural Resources, Driver Services, GEMA, GFA, the Georgia Environment, Environmental Finance Authority, the State Fire Marshal's Office, the Attorney General's Office, and there are a couple more I think I threw up on the slide, but the Governor's Office as well to make sure that they are uh, well informed of regulatory modifications. And this slide is a little harder to read, but this Haley and Matt are going to go into a little more detail on this one. But as you can see, we cover a wide range of issues for our members. And whether they're large or small, all of our locations, all of our members started with one location. And we frequently ask our members, what keeps you up at night? And their answers fall into three different buckets, regulatory, financial, 
and management. And so I know we're pressed on time. So I want to introduce Ms. Haley Bauer. Uh, good morning, y'all. Um, hi, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you so much for having me today. I am very excited to talk to you about my family's business, Clipper Petroleum. Um, where it's kind of up for debate if I'm a third or fourth generation, my great grandparents are from New Jersey. I'm sorry, I was born and raised in the South, so <laughs> don't hold it against me. Um, but my great grandparents ran a restaurant and a Sunoco store in Glassboro, New Jersey. And um, my grandfather was an Amico sales rep and um, he purchased Clipper in uh, the 70s. And uh, my dad, he, he now runs it. And uh, my sister Caroline and I are going to take over for him once he decides to step down. Um, but about Clipper, when you come into one of our stores, uh, our story is so important to us. So I just wanted to quickly share it with you all today. It was founded in 1933 by a man named Mr. Homemeyer, and it was actually called WF Homemeyer Oil. Well, Mr. Homemeyer, he had the opportunity to go on an around the world trip on the Pan Am Clipper airplane. And he was so impressed by the service that he came back to Gainesville, Georgia and renamed his company Clipper Petroleum. So that's where you, we, the airplane comes in is because of the quality of service from the Clipper airplane. <laughs> This is um, quickly our business. So we, Clipper, are the parent company. We own 27 C stores um, in Georgia and South Carolina. Most of our stores are in Georgia. We just have two in South Carolina. And um, we have, we're franchisee, Bojangles, Cinnabon, uh, Subway, Annie Ann's. Anyone a Cinnabon fan in here? Yes. <laughs> um, we also are um, a wholesaler, so I'm going to give you all a little bit of a vocabulary lesson and there will be a quiz. Um, so we uh, supply about 243 accounts in the southeast with fuel and uh, we call them dealers and I know it sounds really weird but I guess it's just an oil term that we use and uh, the dealer is just our customer we don't operate the store we just supply fuel to them. And you may be wondering, well, how do you supply that fuel? Well, we have our own transport company too, Explorers Transport. Um, we have about 35 tanker trucks and we supply and haul all of, all of our fuel um, to most of our stores. The only time we'd ever um, hire a third party um, is in Florida. We only have a couple sites there and um, there's really no reason for us to leave a truck in Florida right now. So, um, but we mostly haul all of our own fuel. Uh, we have our own maintenance department department to uh, work at um, our stores, you know, any HVAC issues, um, if our cap cappuccino machine breaks, our fountain machine breaks. Um, and, you know, as far as brands go, we supply all, um, most of all the major brands. So Amico, um, BP, Exxon, um, and anyone who was an Amico fan back in the day, it's actually back now. So you may be surprised to see uh, the Amico up there, but BP actually just brought it back as their um, sister uh, brand. So you will be seeing more Amicos pop up. Uh, we also have our own nonprofit, like, um, you know, many of uh, our friends in the industry and um, a lot of the automobile dealers, they were saying they're very involved in the community. Uh, so are we. We have our own nonprofit, the Clipper Petroleum Foundation. We started it in 2013 with our main mission to give back to the areas where we do business. We have two fundraisers a year. Um, one is our golf tournament. We get a lot of support from our vendors that we use in the stores, um, from the brands. And it's a really great day to come out, play golf and raise money for a good cause. We also implemented um, a second fundraiser um, two years ago called Roundup for our communities. So in the um, months of September and October, any customer that comes into our store, you can round up to the next dollar or donate a flat dollar fee and all that money will go back to the foundation. Uh, we, we do a lot with schools, um, teachers apply for grants. We do a lot with special needs um, children and adults veterans, um, sex trafficking is a huge, um, 
you know, thing that we're very passionate about, about ending sex trafficking. We've partnered with Wellspring Living for well over um, probably seven to 10 years. Um, they're in Atlanta and uh, I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about that fight in just a minute. Um, real quickly, we gave 51 grants in 2020, and I know I'm going to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 crisis and how it affected our business, but our board was compelled to give to um, health care and to food services. So um, if, you, if you don't know or are not familiar, there's a direct correlation in the school systems with lunches bought on Friday and breakfast that is bought on Monday because kids are going hungry on the weekend. Um, so we uh, were able to donate $40,000 um, to organizations like that, like food pantries, um, like organizations like Backpack Love. Um, and we were even able to give to a, a local um, healthcare uh, organization that was able to test over a thousand um, people who did not have insurance, um, could not afford COVID test, um, they got it for free. So Angela touched on this a minute and I know that we're short on time, but I think this is just too important to just click through. Um, thanks to the Georgia Association of Convenience Stores, we were able to partner with In Our Backyard. They have this really neat program called Convenience Stores Against Trafficking. And Clipper, we have been in the fight, you know, for many years, and this just was another way for us to try to um, educate our customers, educate our team members, and try to be a line of hope out there on the front lines. Um, so what convenience stores that, oh, real quick, sorry, let me tell you a couple things uh, about sex trafficking. It is a $150 billion criminal enterprise. It is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. Um, pimps on average make about $32,000 a week exploiting children. Um, also, uh, the average age of a girl that's sold is between 12 and 14, and the average age of a boy being sold is between 11 and 13 years old. So this is something that we are very passionate about. When you walk into a Clipper store, this is the first thing you'll see on our door is that we care and that we are in the fight in human trafficking. Um, this is what they call a freedom sticker. Um, so if you don't know, you may be wondering, well, why would a convenience store get involved in the fight against human trafficking? That just sounds so silly. Half the population visits a convenience store every single day. So we can be a line of hope. Um, there's also a study that victims who were being trafficked, they all visited a convenience store almost every single day, whether it was to get a drink, to get food, um, to wash up to, for the next person they were being sold to. So this is in the bathroom stalls. And the reason is most of the times when a girl or boy is being trafficked and they come to a, a convenience store, they have somebody called a bottom that's with them. And that is either a woman or a man, could be the pimp um, that you know escorts them into the convenience store. They're not allowed to look at someone, talk to someone, but in the stall, they're by themselves. So if they have anything that they can remember this number, maybe they were able to sneak a phone and they can text where the, these organizations can come in and actually give them freedom. Um, so that is why we are in the fight to end human trafficking. Lastly, um, this is part of the training material that we use to train all of our team members with what to look for. Uh, we took it a step further because we think this is such an important issue that we have these printed and um, they're at our point of sale system so that any of our customers can be educated and learn more about human trafficking. Um, okay, real quickly, uh, COVID-19 impact. Uh, we were down over 50% in March and April. Uh, we're still down about 10 to 15%, 25% in the Atlanta market. And that's for a couple reasons. Um, most people are still working at home. I know a lot of companies, um, specifically I'm uh, talking about our store across from Perimeter Mall. Um, a lot of businesses did not renew their leases because everything seemed to be okay working at home. People aren't traveling as much. Um, it's been tough. Uh, we implemented Hero Pay, so we paid $2 more an hour. Um, and we did that from the beginning of the pandemic till December. Um, we did free coffee, um, free fountain drink. Um, I know my friend Matt, who's gonna speak next, they were doing the same thing. 
Um, and one thing I'm very proud of is we did not make any layoffs. Um, one thing that we did is being down 50%, obviously we had a lot of drivers sitting because there was no fuel to be delivered. No one's traveling. Um, so uh, they really just were great guys and we really have the best team. And they went out to the stores and um, they would get paid to sanitize all the high touch areas so that we could keep our team safe and our customers safe. I'm going to skip this one because I can just go into it, but our struggles right now are labor and growth opportunities. Um, so labor, unemployment, um, and I don't ever want to throw anyone under the bus, and it's been better lately, but we had 139 unemployment claims during the pandemic of last year. Um, we usually have six annually. <laughs> um, our HR girl, I think, was pulling her hair out. Um, and the thing is, most of them, um, we had to do rework to get them reversed. Um, it was people who had never worked at Clipper ever, who had been fired uh, three to four years ago. Um, some employees were still employed and were applying for it and receiving it. Um, so tons of rework on um, our HR team's part. Um, it seems to be a little better. I think the last one we received was in January. Um, so, um, but it has gotten better, I, I will say. Um, our turnover is 150%. Um, and that is because people are scared to work with the general public. Um, and 90% turnover is voluntary. Um, and we actually have that stat because our HR does exit interviews and 90% of the people um, who are leaving, they don't wanna work um, with the public for fear of um, giving, getting COVID-19. Uh, the other major one we're seeing is C-Store growth challenges. So I'm a visual person, so I like to put a lot of pictures in my slides, um, but this is one of our stores. Um, if you come and shop with us, uh, this is one of our South Cobb stores, um, new Clipper image. This is the inside of our store. Um, it seems that some cities and counties do not want convenience stores um, to come into their communities, even though we build a really beautiful store. Um, and I think that's from a stigma of bad operators. I think when you think of some people think of C stores, they think of, oh, they sell drug paraphernalia. Oh, there's pornography in there. Um, it's not clean, things like that. But we have a very clean operation. Our team is wonderful. Um, we have some of the nicest folks that work for us. And, um, you know, we don't sell pornography. We do not sell drug uh, paraphernalia. Um, we're a family business and that's not a family thing. <laughs> um, you know, and, and we're seeing, you know, where there's sort of a bias with the smaller operators, you know, as Angela said, most of our dealers, uh, they have one store, they're not a multi, um, you know, they're just independent operators. Um, so it seems like some of the bigger chains are able to come in with open arms where we're not. Um, and then this is my last slide, what keeps me up at night? Um, I'm an elder millennial, so, <laughs> so is my sister. Um, but these are the things that keep us up at night, the future of fuels. Um, as you all are aware, we have a new administration in. Um, the government seems to really be pushing electric vehicles. Um, one thing that I'm actually shocked to find out is we can't actually charge for electricity in the state of Georgia, and that is 100% true straight from uh, someone at Georgia Power. So how are we supposed to adapt um, when this is going to be the future, apparently? Um, another thing is, you know, if we aren't building new stores, we have to run conduit. So that means we're having to break up concrete, which is expensive, put back concrete, which is expensive. Um, charging stations are not cheap. They run anywhere from 50 to $250,000, and there's no return on investment for that. Um, so we're just trying to figure out how do we adapt? How do we stay relevant with the changing times? Um, you know, can we coexist with EV? hydrogen fuel, low carbon fuel, like what Porsche is doing. So um, that's all I've got, y'all. I tried to talk real fast like a New Yorker. <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions after this because I want to get my friend Matt up here with Friendly Gus to tell you all about his business. Um, and I'll leave some business cards if I can help you all with anything in the, the future, answer questions. Thank Great. you for having me. Thank you. Yes, Matt, we want you to speak. And members of the committee, we want to go a little bit over 
today. And if you have any questions, you can address them to uh, Angela in the Annie room uh, dealing with the convenience stores. And Angela, I think you and I need to talk too. You brought up a lot of interesting things in, in this conversation that we may need to look at. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate um, you and the committee's time today. Um, as the anchor of the relay race, I'll try to endeavor to be the fastest to get y'all out of here to get some food. Um, you know, I, this was not pre-planned, but as, as I sat back kind of going last, listening to the people that preceded me, there's two common themes that stood out. One was family business. When you think of the idea of business, I think it's, it's common to think of this faceless corporation. And the reality is when you see the folks who've talked to you guys today, it's family business and friendly Gus is no different. I'm, I represent the fifth generation in a, in a business that started in 1915. We're in, in Dublin, Georgia. We're not nearly the size of, of Clipper Petroleum, but um, we are nonetheless a family business. And that, that, is, that is the fabric of America, as someone alluded to earlier. So um, we are you know, families that are invested in this. Um, and the, the second theme that I've heard throughout this was the idea of labor issues. Um, and that, and friendly guess again, is no exception. Um, this year, or in 2020 rather, our turnover was 117%. So we're turning over our entire workforce over one time in, in a year. And I, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, you know, what kind of operation are you guys running? Well, half of our workforce has been there for over a year. So the reality is it's the other half. It's that zero to three month time frame of people who are coming to work with us. We're just churning that consistently time and time again. So it's, 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 it's very difficult to to acquire new talent and to maintain new talent. And I, and I get it, you know, people I don't think wake up, you know, when they're thinking other than my son, you know, what are you gonna be when you grow up? It's, it's not to work in a convenience store, you know, so we're realistic, but at the same time, it is a real problem we're facing. And there is a correlation between the high turnover rate and the rate at which we're seeing unemployment cases. I handle all of our unemployment claims and they're staggering. It just like Haley mentioned, there's, a, there's wrought with fraud and there's abuse and we have people who who have not worked for our company or who are currently working for our company that are still pursuing unemployment benefits and the crazy thing is it's being granted so then i have to take time to appeal these things and it's just become a, a very daunting task that's wasting everyone's time and expense so um again i i think those are some of the more specific issues with respect to labor and as a result of that turnover, we're seeing some of the highest overtime that we've paid in company history. So we are very um, grateful for the folks who have stuck with us through this pandemic because it is real. And we, and we respect the fact that, you know, the exposure is, or is a potential risk. Um, and within that, I, I do think, you know, I, I don't want this to be a, just an airing of the grievances, you know, small business. I think the legislature did a phenomenal job, in my opinion, of handling the COVID pandemic. I think one of which was, Governor Kemp's designation as an essential business was crucial to allow us to stay open because we operate two truck stops on I-16 and having that flow of commerce come through was vital to keeping things running. So that was, um, was very important. And in addition to that, having the heightened burden of proof for any potential tort litigation out of this has also given us some assurance to stay open that we're not exposing ourselves to any sort of uh, lawsuits. So, and that finally, is my, my last point is the idea of, of lawsuits. Um, I was actually an attorney here in Atlanta for about seven years, practiced with a, a large insurance defense firm um, before my father-in-law tricked me into coming, joining the convenience store business. But um, so I've, I have some working knowledge of, of the idea of tort reform. And I think it's like trying to eat an elephant, you know, in, in one sitting, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a massive thing to undertake. But I do think there is a mentality that I've seen on this side of it, of the sue for settlement mentality. I'll give you an example. We have in one of our stores, we have the cooler doors, you know, with the drinks and things. And one of them was starting to crack and you could kind of hear it starting to splinter. Well, there's a guy that walked up to it and he's literally just stood there right in front of the cooler. Unfortunately, my manager walked up to it and asked what he was doing. He said, I might be let this follow me so I can get paid. You know, so fortunately she was there and got the guy out of the way, but then sure enough, the thing cracks. And, but for her coming up there, you know, he would have had a lawsuit against us. And I think that's the problem is, is this is the mentality that, you know, the business will take care of it sort of thing. Well, there's really a cost associated with that. And Georgia is becoming one of the most litigious states in the country. And I don't think that's something that we want to be known for. 
So one of the things, and again, I, I, it's like eating an elephant in one sitting, but I think there is something real that we could potentially tackle is one, the idea of phantom damages. I think Georgia is unique in that a potential plaintiff can represent to a jury what their medical costs were when reality it was a fraction of what that cost was. So as an attorney, when we were evaluating cases, you typically start with like what someone's medical expenses are, and then you work for some multiple of that. Well, what happens is, as you all know, from healthcare, you get a discounted rate. You know, you're not paying the street price for what your, your bills are. You're paying a discounted rate. Well, the plaintiff represents to a jury that I actually incurred this cost at the, at the street price. Well, the reality is they did it. So it's this phantom damage idea. So you're working from a higher multiplier to get these massive awards. So that's why you have this mentality of these folks coming in saying, hey, well, I'm going to get paid today because friendly Gus has this cooler door break on us. Well, we have, we have these things happen time and time again. And again, it, it is, a, is a, a very loaded topic and I get that. But I do think there, that is something as far as a small business, we are the ones absorbing the risk with this, you know, we are absorb the ones absorbing this and there's a cost associated with it. So um, again, I, I, I do, you know, recognize I'm going last and you know, I, I, you know, you guys are um, pressed for time, but I do appreciate the opportunity. I do appreciate in, in all sincere, uh, sincerity that and you guys taking the time to meet with small businesses. I think that does make folks like myself very appreciative of that. And just hopefully we can communicate to you guys, you know, we're real people, you know, we're families and we, we take um, pride in what we do and we appreciate you guys receiving that um, here. So thank you guys very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Matt. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, um, bringing that to our attention. Um, I really appreciate all our presenters today, both from the automobile dealers and the convenience stores. And uh, before we close, I, I want to say a couple of things that, uh, Y'all have got some really good advocates. I mean, Ben and Bill uh, with the automobile dealers and Angela with the Convenience Store Association, they work hard for your industry and they represent y'all well, extremely well. And uh, I very much appreciate um, bringing some of the issues that, face, that you face every day. My committee and myself will meet with Ben and Jordan privately, you know, when I say one-on-one -on -one outside of the co uh, committee uh, and talk about some of the issues with Angela, we see Angela daily. So please share your concerns with, with Angela and we'll get together and talk and see what we can do. Uh, those concerns are important. Uh, the second thing I wanna say is, Committee, uh, because uh, the presentations were so important and they went over, over time, I want to thank you all for your dedication. Um, members, thank you very, very much for staying in and listening to the real concerns of the family businesses that, that are our friends and our neighbors. So thank you. I, I think I've got the best committee in the house, to be perfectly frank with you. And... Um, Committee members, if you have any other questions, as I say, said, please contact Ben and, and Angela and uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you.